views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Moms, are you raising your kids to believe they can create the life of their dreams? Are you living your life that way as well? Living an awakened life means more than just talking about it. Join host Debbie Pokornik on Vibrant Powerful Moms as she shares practical tips, stories, and interviews with enlightened guests, all geared at helping you create and live an extraordinary life. It's time to stand firmly in your power and model the life you want for your kids to inherit. And it all begins now on Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to the Vibrant Powerful Mom Show. I'm your host, Debbie Pokornik, and my mission is to help you create a life you love at work, at home, and at play. Today, we have a beautiful soul joining us named Susan M. Hoskins. Susan has written an inspiring new book called The Way of the One, which was awarded first place in religion, spiritual nonfiction in the 2019 Colorado Independent Publishers Association Awards. Phew. <laughs> Susan has written several other books, including some fictional stories. So if you like what you hear today, be sure to do a search on her name and or go to thewayoftheone.org to find out more. Today, she's here to talk to us about living the way of the one, which to me is about fully embracing who you have come here to be with an open heart, conscious intention, and a conscious surrender to the one. Now, because Susan covers so much information in her book, and because I have discovered during our previous conversations that I absolutely love spending time with her, I know that we're going to need more than one interview to do this topic justice. So for today, our focus is going to be on our kids and our grandkids. Now, Susan says, we are the bridge between the beautiful enlightened souls we know as our children and grandchildren, and what can often seem like quite a tumultuous, divisive world that they have chosen to be born into. So how do we together embody and expand the heart-centered consciousness of the way of the one? And that is what we're going to talk about today. Susan, welcome to the Vibrant Powerful Mom Show. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Good morning. Good morning to you, too. Now, actually, it's, it's afternoon everywhere <laughs> else, but good morning anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. I always... Uh, <laughs> good morning. Good... <laughs> yeah. Good everything. <laughs> good everything. <laughs> yeah. So I always like to give my guests a chance to share a bit about who they are beyond their bio. Now, I realize I didn't really read your bio because I felt inspired to share other stuff instead. <laughs> but please, like, tell us just a few highlights from your life that feel most relevant for our conversation today. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, I would say what's most relevant from my life is just the fact that it's been the most incredible events that have caused me to grow. So rather than sharing, you know, much about me, I am an ordained minister. I am a, an author, a published author of several books, nonfiction and fiction. I have a doctorate degree in holistic theology. I'm a mom and a grandmom. Love those roles dearly. <laughs> but most of all, I am a spiritual being loving my human experience, even though at times it's painful and at times it's joy filled. But I love being here and sharing with you today. Oh. Beautiful. And I hear you, sister. <laughs> Amen, <laughs> I feel the sister. same way. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. So what was the inspiration for writing The Way of the One? Oh, I love that question. The actual inspiration that now was the time to write the book occurred during the first presidential debates of the 2016 election. And at that time, I was hosting a spiritual group on Sundays in my home. And so this became a topic of conversation, which evolved into the book. And what do I mean? I was inspired. When the debates began, it didn't matter whether they were Republicans or Democrats, there was one single word 
that each of the candidates used over and over again. And I would ask your audience if they have any idea what the word was. Well, the word was fight. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter who they were. Each of them stood at the podium and told exactly what they were going to fight for and how they were going to fight everybody else for the privilege of doing so. And they were going to fight each other candidate on the podium for the privilege of being able to be the voice of what they were going to fight about. And after the debates, the media talked about who threw the punch, who counterpunched, right. and who threw the knockout punch. And at that time, what I realized that we had become such a culture of battling that we no longer choose our leaders based on ideals, but rather on how they fight and their ability mm -hmm. to talk about fighting. And I thought, oh, we need to change this consciousness from one of the warrior, constant battle, to instead the way of the one. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you shared that because I have, I have felt this way for a very long time. And mine has been specifically around hearing people say the fight against cancer, the, oh. the battle against teenage pregnancy, that, you know, these kinds of things that have always felt wrong to me. It's like we're, we're tearing ourselves apart when we start thinking that way. So, Let's let's dive right in because I know Good. this is a big part in your book. <laughs> it and, is. Uh, yeah, right at the beginning, you talk about the way of the warrior and and how we symbolically give our our children these these three things: our goggles, swords, and a shield, and that they're meant to yes. carry these throughout life, and we all carry them as well. So let's let's dive into that. Explain that to us. Oh, I'd love to. I think the notion of battling is so terribly ingrained that when a newborn arrives, we slap them on the rump and we do present them with goggles, swords, and shields to be able to navigate throughout this lifetime. And what I mean by that is all of us are colored by our family and culture's belief system. So we present our newborns with goggles of perspective and, you know, goggles are protective eyewear with side shields. And we present our newborns with goggles in order to narrow their perspective and focus and buffer them from the world. And what I mean specifically by that is I was born in the 1950s into a Caucasian Irish American home where my father was the homemaker. My, I mean, my father was the provider, my mother the homemaker. And options for girls were very limited at that time. I was told that I lived the one true faith. I've been lucky enough to be born Catholic. And then I went to school and I pledged allegiance to the flag of one nation, the best nation in the world under God. And so that was my perspective looking at the world. Mm -hmm. And many of us wear our goggles where we're taught that our particular culture or religion or country is superior to everyone else's. And that's what I mean about goggles. What I mean about the sword is that <clears throat> as young children, oh, it starts so early with the cartoons they watch and the, and the games they play where there's always a good guy battling the bad guy. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, you know, putting on my cowboy boots and my six shooter and, and battling the Indians. For our children today, it's, you know, intergalactic people like Darth Vader and Star Wars. And we learn to do battle good guys versus bad guys even and then it, runner and uh, <laughs> wally coyote <laughs> oh every cartoon always has the yeah. good guys every movie there's uh, you know and and then as our kids get older they play video games and they watch more movies where violence is the norm and even as we become adults it's always a battle of the good guys versus the bad guys and we also present our newborns with shields because they're taught early on to fear enemies everywhere from, you know, enemies on distant shores to bullies at school to our own mind, which I think is the bloodiest battlefield there is, to germs lurking everywhere, just waiting to invade your body. Mm -hmm. Even our genes. Oh, or, yes. Or, you know, that's a big thing right now that your genes are turning against you, you know, and, and you've got this gene that sets you up for failure for life. Because, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. you said something really important at the beginning I don't want to lose sight of, which is the whole notion that we're supposed to 
battle illnesses and battle cancer and fight, fight, fight. And what I often say is the sad thing about that is it's a setup for disaster because if our loved one dies as a result of an illness, then even their obituary states, oh, they lost their final battle, Mm -hmm. even though they fought valiantly. And I think, what a sad legacy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. And one of the things I want to mention is that in your book, um, you at the end of every chapter, you give that beautiful little summary of the highlights, which I love for someone like me that just helps me to remember, you know, what, what the pieces were, because I had so many moments where I went, Oh, this is good. Oh, I like this, you know. Um, But then you also give ways to integrate. And so at the end of that chapter, you offered a little challenge that to me felt um, really powerful, I think, for people that might be listening and might be going, yeah, it's not that big a deal we don't you know my kids I'm open I'm raising them with open eyes so you know they're not wearing their goggles but um do you know that challenge offhand or do you want me to read it oh if you've got it handy please I I do (laughs) because I would always need that so it says for a week record every time you find yourself engaging in a conflict with another person or your own mind. Mm. Also note when you hear others say the words fight and battle, paying special attention to the use of these words when talking about political issues or disease. And for me, I mean, one of the things that made me stop was when you mentioned about how we even say with our kids, pick your battles. Oh, yes. And I say that. I have said that. (laughs) I never really thought about it because I know my meaning behind it. Right. My meaning is let's not waste energy, you know, on fighting with our kids where we don't need to. But now that I have heard this from you, it's it sort of made me stop and go, yeah, why does everything have to be a fight? Why does well, it have to be exactly. that way? Right. And even with our children, if we think about competitive sports and even yes. as adults, it, we no longer just go out to play a football game on a Sunday afternoon, flag football. My grandsons play flag football. But I hear coaches very early on saying to kids, your enemy is the opposing team and we've got to defeat the enemy. And once again, here we are, the good guys fighting the bad guys. And so I think it's everywhere. I think it's really important to stop and listen to what's going on in our mind when we so casually talk about fighting or battling and and most especially within our own minds about ourselves. How, how often do we spend time during our day battling things we don't like about ourselves in our own mind? Mm-hmm. Age, weight, how we look what we think, who we love. You know, I, I say it again. I think our mind is often the bloodiest battlefield there is. So, you know, I just urge us all to pause and become very aware when we use the term, I'm going to fight for something or battle something or with our kids, good guys versus the bad guys. Great. Yeah, absolutely. This is my battle. You know, I'm going to fight this all the way. (laughs) Right. And we say it now often, especially when we're talking about disease, we're, we're, we're trying to create this picture of this beautiful, brave warrior. Oh, I know. One of the things I really love about your book that came across quite quite strongly for me is that it's it's not a fight at all. The gentler we become, the more love uh, that we surround ourselves with, the more compassion. When we're looking at ourselves, when we're dealing with others, it doesn't matter. Um, The more we do that, the more we remove all of the, the dangers, really, that come with battle. Oh, I love that, Debbie, because I firmly believe that we choose our life experiences prior to birth for what we're here to learn, for our souls to evolve. And so it's been life-changing for me to view 
everything that happens in my life as a choice I've made in order to grow or to learn. And since our, our souls are eternal, I think we certainly get many, many chances to, to be in the physical form and, and deal with life issues. So that has been huge for me in even viewing um, – illnesses in, a, in an entirely different way. I mean, I'll share with you that um, I'm celebrating my 10th wedding anniversary with my beloved husband this week, and, and we're actually going to go on an anniversary trip back to the Mayo Clinic because he's, he has a number of health issues that um, we have learned to embrace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I could have very easily um, adopted a victim mentality of, oh, why is this happening? And he's such a good guy and all that. And and this this way of thinking about, okay, we are here to embrace this and see what we're to learn from it. And I remember setting intention before I met Larry, which was I really wanted at this stage of life to really know love fully in a relationship. I mean – really know it fully and so my husband comes into my life and pretty early on we had really significant health challenges and I thought I got I got my intention because now I've learned to love through illness which is huge absolutely okay so there's so many pieces there that I'm Okay, let, let's go. <laughs> let, let's it. regroup. Cause, okay. <laughs> before we know it, we're going to be out of time. I know. Um, so, so let's go back to where you mentioned about planning our birth and such. Sure. Like you have a, a doctorate in this. And so how sure. does your doctorate work exploring pre-birth planning, soul choice, and soul families help us to understand the ways we can assist the young people in our lives oh you know, gosh, and help them that. to evolve? Yeah. Well, I love this question, Debbie, because uh, I really learned from my doctorate dissertation research that we as souls plan our family lives together. And so, therefore, we also live as souls in family clusters on the other side, which which I find very comfort- comforting. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, this lifetime, for example, uh, I chose to be this woman in this body raising a particular daughter, having two grandsons, and we all learn from one another. And who knows what roles we served before, but it is all a wonderful learning that we've chosen to experience together this lifetime. And to me, that just makes everything rich mm-hmm. and meaningful. Oh, I love that. And I've, that's something that I say often. <laughs> Your child <laughs> chose you, they chose this life. And I know a lot of people, um, they feel a little bit almost threatened by that, probably because of our whole goggle shield sword thing, right? right? But they feel like, are you telling me that I, I'm causing this, that, you know, I have brought this into my life because I wanted it. And, you know, I just think that's such an important thing for us to understand is, it's not about like, yes, it can be painful, but at the same time, you knew you could grow beyond it. Exactly. You know, you, you coming in, you were already like, this is what's going to be, um, make the biggest difference for, for me, but me being all of us because we are all one. And yeah, I think it's such a fascinating thing, but I get it that it's mind boggling for a lot of people. Oh, I do too. You know, the, the fact, but what was most, I think, most profound in my life learning for me with all this was that I'm not a victim of anything. And I don't have to worry about being a victim mm-hmm. of anything because I will be protected from anything my soul has not chosen to experience this lifetime. And I know that firsthand. And then with the things that I do experience, I've chosen, and as I said at the beginning of this, when you asked me a little bit about my bio, It has been those very things that I have grown through and that have made the biggest difference in my life. Mm -hmm. What was, what seemed so painful at the time truly has resulted in great growth. And, and I think that's what we're here to do is to learn and grow and be of service. I love that. Yes. And I always like to say to people, these things are not done to you. They're done for you. Exactly. And if you can see them as the ladder that they are, yeah, it's strenuous to climb. 
<laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> oh, I agree. I so agree. And and you used the bridge at the beginning of our of our show together. And yes, I do think we as adults here, mothers and grandmothers, and are here to be the bridge between our beautiful souls who are born in straight from spirit with love, with oneness. And we are here having grown, having realized we wear goggles, probably having removed them to see the world in a different light. And we are here to help our children and grandchildren navigate through this world that can often seem oh, so divisive, ugly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes. It's very interesting. Can you can you share a little bit more about how we can be that bridge? Well, I think by being our own awareness and by, first of all, I think making sure we have taken off our goggles and inspected them. I, I want to know what goggles I've given to my children, my child, and, and on down to the grandchildren, but I can't know unless I truly look and go, oh, that's why I used to view the world in a particular way. Oh, this is where I battle. This is the sword I carry, or this is what I'm afraid of. And once we can realize what our particular goggles, swords, and shields are, we can reach back to our children to see what we might have already given them. And then I think we can help bridge this whole notion of oneness versus fighting and how even in the little things, we can help them begin even at school to see it differently to see that you know like in dealing with a bully how do you deal with a bully who's all about fighting and good guys versus bad guys and all that ugliness how do we be the bridge to say how can we do this from oneness in our heart rather the than the illusions in our mind that of separation where there has to be me versus you us versus them Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it, it is just, it's such a big um, thing for us to understand that we really are role modeling this more than saying, hey, this is what I've learned. So now this is what you need to know. Like put down oh, exactly. your sword. <laughs> you yeah, know? Exactly. We have to role model it and live it. So we're quickly running out of time. I'm going to give people a bit more information about how they can find out more about you. And then if we have time, we'll zip back to some Good. more of our questions. Okay? Wonderful, wonderful. So you can find out more about Susan by going to her website at thewayoftheone.org. So that's all those words, thewayoftheone.org. And if you add a forward slash VPM, which stands for Vibrant Powerful Moms, of course, and another forward slash giveaway, you will find three gifts, which is a video based on today's uh, talk, as well as a handout about being a bridge, or the bridge, I shouldn't say a bridge, because, you know, it's a pretty specific bridge, <laughs> and a sample chapter from the Way of the One book. So go to thewayoftheone.org forward slash BPM forward slash giveaway and pick those up today. Now, we uh, are very close to the end of our time, but I already knew that I'd have to have Susan back on. So I want you to know that Susan is going to be back on with me uh, very soon, so probably in a week or two, and um, then we'll be able to go a little bit deeper into this. Now, Susan, we have a couple minutes left, so I want to ask you about, uh, and I'm not sure if we can fit this in a couple minutes, but what is the sacred circle of the one? Uh, the sacred circle of the one is how we can come together as a community to become one and to foster one and to grow together living the way of the one. So I talk about the sacred circle of one on the website, thewayoftheone.org, and ways for us to communicate together so we can learn together how to embody a brand new heart-centered consciousness of oneness instead of the way of the warrior. So I invite people to come to the website and please join us as we grow together in this wonderful community of oneness. Nice. So this is, is part of your movement. Correct. Correct. Nice. Okay. Awesome. Well, I think we even have time for a little bit more, which oh, is good. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so um, what do I want to ask you here? 
how can understanding the way of the one give us the hope and the strength to envision a world that transcends the way of the warrior? We've kind of already gone into that, but can you give us a 30 second blurb on that? Sure. I think by learning to live a heart-centered consciousness of love and oneness, we can almost live in a parallel universe to what's going on with people who want to continue to embrace the way of the warrior. I think it's possible, and I think it's very needed. Mm, Nice. Very nice. Susan, thank you so much for all that you've shared with us today. I really appreciate you, and I'm so happy that we get to continue our chat. (laughs) Thank you, Debbie. It's been a pleasure. Oh, wonderful. And a big thank you to you, our listeners. With much respect for you and the journey you are on, this is Debbie Pokornik and her guest, Susan Hoskins, wishing you a vibrant and powerful day. You've been listening to Vibrant Powerful Moms with host Debbie Pokornik. If you've enjoyed this show, please share it with others to help spread the love. To find out more about Debbie, pick up free offers from the show and listen to previous episodes, visit VibrantPowerfulMoms.com.